If you can recall going back to the early chapters in chapters 2 and 3, <clears throat> remember when Jesus mailed seven letters or sent them to seven churches in Asia Minor? And if you recall, and I'm going to throw this little question out to you, he made a different promise to each of those churches. They all had to do with eternity, but they were entirely different promises, one from the other. However, there was a condition that had to be met to obtain the promise. It was the same in every case. Who can tell me what it was? It had to be an overcomer. The promise was always made and kept to the overcomer, to the overcomer. But nowhere in Revelation is it, is it explained how to overcome. We're going to look at a very unique passage this morning, for which reason I'm a little sad that so many people are sick, and I know they are, even my son's shop, but they almost had to close it down because of sickness. But uh, so many people would really need to look at this passage. I almost considered leaving it, but we'll, we'll do it this morning. In it, we're going to see the secret we might say today. No, I, I, I don't like to use that word because there's nothing in the Bible that's a secret. It's a revelation of how to become an overcomer. It is so important that we see it. It's so important that we make note of it. In fact, to be sure that you saw it, when I'm done and I'm going to make some comments on the passage we're going to look at this morning, uh, I, I want you to see if you saw it. What does it take to become an overcomer? It's going to show us here in this passage. It's found in the book of Romans chapter 8. Would you turn there, please? The book of Romans chapter 8. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for your grace, for Jesus and God, for making a way, God, for people to live victoriously in Jesus Christ, God, and to become everything, Father, you want us to be in this world, no matter how evil it be. God, I pray this morning as we look to your word that, God, you'll help us each through your spirit to carefully inspect it, God. Look, look, look very frugally, God, for those little indications in there, God, that just uh, just reach out to us and show us things, God, that perhaps we're aware of and just need to be reminded of or maybe never saw before. And I pray that, God, this morning as we look together to your word, that, God, it'll have meaning for each of us, make us better people, and help us to leave this building, God, a little bit more equipped than what we came in. God, just bless us richly through Jesus and through your word, we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Hebrews 5, verses 13 and 14 tell us that, Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised or trained to discern both good and evil. Now, today's passage is going to be a kind of meaty one. It's going to be a meaty one. But if we study it carefully and apply its teachings to our life, believe me, the results could be definitely wonderful, wonderful. Okay, in chapter 7, the chapter before the one we're going to look at now, not the whole chapter, but parts of it, in chapter 7 of this book, we learn some very surprising things about the Apostle Paul. First of all, though he was a Christian with a brand new nature and one who had all of the right convictions in place, he hated evil. In verse 15 of chapter 7, Delighted in God's law, in verse 22. Desired to do good, in verse 19. And made every attempt to be good, in verse 21. Nevertheless, he couldn't make any progress at all as a Christian. Instead, he repeatedly failed and wound up seeing himself as a wretched man, in verse 24. At this point, frustrated and totally defeated, he cried out, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And when that came the answer, Jesus Christ, our own Lord. So the lesson to be learned in chapter 7 is this. When we got saved, we were given a brand new nature that makes us want to live for Jesus and do His will. That's all that we possess. Everything else must come from Jesus daily. The power to overcome, the power to succeed as a Christian, in fact, the very power to be a Christian. Right. Well, chapter 7 was very educational. It was also very disheartening, since it shows us the dark side of our old nature and also, listen, the limitations of our new one. 
So what better way for chapter 8 to get started than the state as it does in verse number 1. There is therefore now, presently, we find ourselves this second, <laughs> no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now this verse puts an official end to all of the failure experienced in chapter 7. Christians here aren't merely willing to obey, but lack the power to obey. They want to be victorious, and they are victorious. And notice how they accomplish this in the second half of the verse. They walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, walking after the flesh is what the lost do every moment of their life. And also what some Christians do when they're not focused on Jesus or depending on Him. So to avoid this, <clears throat> this walking after the flesh, notice we're to walk instead after the Spirit, which means we're to step our way through life in fellowship with God's Spirit, who will direct our paths and enable us to overcome. And incidentally, this word condemnation speaks of God's sentence upon sin. But for those who are in Christ Jesus, such a sentence has been entirely removed. All right, since this verse we just looked at is the bridge between chapter 7 and chapter 8, the words walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit are critically important because in them we find the solution to all of the problems mentioned in chapter 7. When you walk in the Spirit, you no longer have to say what Paul said in verse number, or chapter 7, what I hate that do I. You can now say, what I hate I've overcome. But listen, if you want to continue to overcome, here's something else you should do. Be sure to avoid all modern translations of the Bible. Need a good reason to? They have left those words out. Would you believe? I mean, the very part of the verse that shows us how to escape condemnation and how to fulfill God's will for your life, to walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, they left it out. They left it out. And we wonder why the majority of Christians don't have it right. If their Bible doesn't have it right, how on this earth can they have it right? You see, well, they're still uncondemned, notice, because they're in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Listen, Paul was also in Christ Jesus in chapter 7 where he couldn't have been a Christian. What did he need to do now was walk in the Spirit to remain uncondemned. We're going to definitely see that later on in the passage. And let's look at verse number 2. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Now this law of sin and death is an inflexible law that makes an exception of nobody. Ezekiel 18, 4 states, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But lesser laws must submit themselves to God's higher ones, as we see here. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is now the prevailing law, since Jesus decimated sin's power and broke death's hold, hath made me free or delivered me from the law of sin and death. And how was that made possible? Remember, death is the punishment for man's mistakes. But... When he claimed the life of Jesus, who was entirely innocent, that was death's mistake. Because while under the power of death, Jesus took back his life and conquered death in the process. Right, concerning the mammoth differences between chapter 7 and chapter 8, Bruce says this, So long as Christians endeavor to rely on their own resources, they fight a losing battle. When they avail themselves of the resources of life and power that are theirs in Christ Jesus, they are more than conquerors. There is therefore no reason why they should go on in a life of servitude, bound to carry out the dictates of the tyrannical law of sin and death. Christ dwells in them by His Spirit, and His Spirit infuses into them a new principle, the law of life, which is, a stronger, than, which is stronger than indwelling sin and sets them free from its tyranny. With the entry of the Spirit, there is no further talk of defeat. The conflict goes on, but where the Spirit is in control, the power of indwelling sin is mastered. 
All right, in verse number three, Paul further explains what he said in verse number two, four, what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So notice what the law couldn't do, and also what all of mankind together couldn't do, Jesus all by himself accomplished. Look at this marvelous verse again, a piece at a time. What the law could not do, not so much in itself, but notice in that it was weak through the flesh or through man's fallen nature that couldn't meet its requirements. God, the verse continues, who could no longer endure man's failure, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, which was the target and focus of all God's anger, condemned sin, just as sin had condemned us in the flesh. So though Jesus, while in the flesh, had the capacity to sin, he was guilty of none. While he bore our likeness, he didn't bear our character. Instead, by his own character, he made up for ours. You know, there is not a person alive that can refute this fact that Jesus Christ did more, listen carefully, for the entire human race than the entire human race ever did for itself. One drop of his blood could have saved everyone who ever lived and quenched hell's fires forever. However, the lost, they don't want this salvation, do they? Which means what? But all of the blessings, all of the goodness, all of the power has been left for us. So avail yourself of all of it. Okay, let's see why Jesus condemned sin as verse 3 tells us he did. Look at verse number 4. That the righteousness of the Lord might be fulfilled in us. Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now notice again the reason. That the righteousness of the law, in other words, all of its merit and goodness, that it might have bestowed upon people, might be fulfilled in us. Listen, if men had obeyed the law and never broken it once, the law would have acquitted them and declared them all righteous. But there is none righteous, no, not one. So all stand condemned. But since Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law by obeying it perfectly, and then fulfilled its penalty by dying for all of man's sins, what the law couldn't do before, it can do now. It can look upon us as though we had never sinned, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. But notice again the important qualifier at the end of the verse. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, which pictures those who cleave to God's Spirit and who follow His leading every moment of their life. But when they do, how different will they be from those who walk after the flesh? Martin Luther answers, Divine grace working in man places nothing above God. In all things it sees only Him, desires only Him, and strives only after Him. Everything else that intervenes between itself and God, it ignores as though it did not exist. Corrupt human nature, however, only seeks, desires, and strives after itself. Whatever intervenes, even God himself, it ignores as though he did not exist. It is directed only toward itself, such as the fluid in the wicked heart. Now, all of this is certainly confirmed in verse number five. For they that are after the flesh do mind or think of the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. I tell you, the Bible presents an entirely different picture of what a Christian should be than what we do today. And listen, what we just read isn't simply a call to be single-minded. Rather, this is a call to be totally different from the people of the world. And how do we gauge this? Generally, whatever the lost are doing, we should be doing the opposite. That they love vile entertainment, we should hate it. Do they hate the Bible? We should love it. Because notice, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, which means they crave these things. They crave them. They will trip over each other to buy the newest Harry Potter book or fall at the feet of some rock star. But they that are after the Spirit, Paul says, the things of the Spirit. In other words, they match the zeal of the lost with their hunger for the things of God. So a sure way to determine, listen to this, if you're spiritual or carnal, is to ask yourself this question. In which direction do my thoughts travel with the most amount of ease? Towards the things of the flesh, 
Do I mind the things of the flesh or towards the things of the Spirit? All right, while the Christian lives in the Spirit, they must also choose to walk in the Spirit. That's what Paul told us to do in Colossians, Galatians, I'm sorry, 5.25. If you live in the Spirit, he said, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, why is that so much a must? Because it's only by walking in the Spirit that we can maintain our life in the Spirit. Now, if we fail to do this, eventually the Spirit will leave us. Our spiritual man will die. It will return to the state we were in when we were lost. So perhaps to keep that from happening, Paul would begin in verse number 6 to remind us of how dreadful our state was when we were lost. Let's look at verse number 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now in this verse, like in verse number 5, we see two lights going in opposite directions. Only here you can see the outcome. And notice, as with their lights, so with the outcomes. Pulls apart. For to be carnally minded or to be drawn to the world through our thoughts is death, which for the moment is spiritual death, eventually to become eternal death. But to be spiritually minded or to be constantly God conscious is life and peace. Now, to remain spiritually minded in a world with so many distractions isn't a very easy thing to do. It can only be accomplished when we practice the disciplines of walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. right, as a little side note to this verse, let me mention this. To treat all of the madness and mental disorder in our society today, we have doctors, hospitals, clinics, the whole science of psychiatry. But brethren, it's the carnal mind that's the culprit. So what is the solution? People have got to get saved and become spiritually minded. That's the solution. Come to Jesus. All right, in verse number 6, Paul tells us to be carnally minded as death and explains why in verse number 7. Look at this verse. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. But it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, brethren, that would be a horrible state for a Christian to return to. I mean, it's one thing to be carnally minded from birth but to become spiritually minded through the rebirth, and then to return to a carnal mind, must be a very dark experience. And for the most obvious of reasons, because notice as our verse tells us, the carnal mind, which is full of itself and its earthly interests, look at this, is enmity against God. Do you know what that means? It views God with hostility. Actually, it sees Him as its enemy. In fact, Vine points out that the word enmity here is the opposite of agape and love. Therefore, how careful we have to be that we never return to a carnal mind. And how does a carnal mind get started? When we are drawn back to the things of the world. And how evil could it end up? Our verse tells us, for the carnal mind is enmity against God. Why? But it is not subject to the law of God which means it refuses to yield to his laws voluntarily or by force. It is not subject to the law of God. Notice, neither indeed can be, which proves that a lost person cannot obey God. Their carnality and God's holiness are continually at war. Therefore, we're told in verse number 8, So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, God's pleasure goes from Jesus, and whom he is well pleased, to the lost who don't please him at all. Bound up in their sins, they can't love God, obey God, or even appreciate God. Thus, they don't please God. Apart from salvation through Jesus, their nature is hopeless and beyond self-repair. All right, having illustrated what we should never want to become again, Paul tells us in verse number 9, But ye are not in the flesh as those mentioned in verses 5 and 8, but in the Spirit, <clears throat> if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, watch it, he is none of his. Now, obviously, a statement like that completely refutes the idea that anybody could ever belong to God without first belonging to Jesus. 
It doesn't matter how good they are or how religious they are. If they don't have the Spirit of Christ. Notice, please, they are what? None of His. None of His. Even that precious little grandmother, who God has to be pleased with, if she's not saved, she's none of His. That priest or that nun, they gave their entire life to religious work. If they're not saved, they're none of His. Even those poor kids in the neighborhood running around in rags who eat one meal a day, if they're not saved, they're none of His. Brother, may a verse like this open our eyes to the plight of the lost. May it burden our hearts to reach out to those God has placed in our lives. Because while they don't belong to God, no one is more anxious than God is for them to become His. Let's look at verse number 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, or because it still has carnal appetites that once and for all must be destroyed. But only physical death awaits our body, not eternal death, as we'll see. So the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness, or because God has made us righteous and enabled us to live good lives. Verse number 11, but if the spirit, the Holy Spirit of him, meaning the Father, the raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, my, there you are in some pretty marvelous fellowship with all of the members of the Trinity, he that raised up Christ from the dead, and a great display of power, shall also with that exact same power quicken or make alive your mortal bodies, when he changes them into immortal bodies. By what means? By his Spirit that dwelleth in you, or by the Holy Spirit who rides, resides in you, awaiting the Father's command to perform this supernatural feat. Right, to further encourage us to walk in the Spirit, and by doing so, to walk away from the world and not back to it, Paul cites these facts in verses 12 and 13. Look at these carefully. Therefore, brethren, we are dead as not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now what Paul says here, that we are dead as not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, he's saying that since we became saved, we owe our flesh nothing. But we have to care for our body and supply its needs. We don't have to accommodate its desires for evil. Verse 13, but if you live after the flesh and fail to take seriously the advice he just gave, what will be the outcome? Look at this, ye shall die. Which of course only makes sense. If to live after the flesh means death for a sinner, then to live after the flesh also means death for the Christian. Now obviously this is not a reference, please, to physical death. Because physical death is a certainty and not contingent upon anything. Both saints and sinners physically die. The death referred to here is clearly eternal death. But the verse continues. If ye through the Spirit do mortify or kill the deeds of the body, deny them their fulfillment, ye shall live. Which also doesn't mean to be alive as we presently are. Both sinners and saints are presently alive. It means to live for eternity as the redeemed of God. And now this is testified to in Galatians 6, 8. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption or ruination, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Right, notice again, please, that verse 13 doesn't say, if ye mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Brother, would you please make special note of this? God doesn't want our deliverance coming any other way. Because when a person overcomes their own sin and on their own, two things generally occur. One, pride sets in. I stop smoking. I stop drinking. And two, a self-deliverance isn't likely to last. For example, a person who quits drinking on their own in time often returns to the habit or lives a frustrated life because they don't. McLean had some very good counsel on deliverance. Listen to what he said. There are people who say that when we are Christian, God gives us the power to overcome sin. He does not. If he did, 
You would surely be self-righteous, proud, and self-sufficient. God comes into you and overcomes sin as you yield to Him. Why does He do that? He does that to make us cling to Him in trust, second by second, moment by moment, hour by hour. This is so that our praise and boasting will not be about ourselves, but about the Lord Jesus. This is why Galatians 5.16 promises, if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right, I don't want to take this in. I, I got a couple little other things I want to share with you, but on the basis of what we saw here, brethren, how does Paul propose we be an overcomer? What, 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 what was it? What, what do we see here? I want to be sure we all got this. What is it in this particular passage that Paul proposes we do to be an overcomer? Walk in the Spirit. <laughs> You've you got to see this. I mean, we know this, but do we apply this? We have to walk in the Spirit. There's no other way. What would it mean to walk in the Spirit? Okay. Okay, very good. But let, let, let's construct a little something here. I have a little question I wrote down here that I want to ask you. Going back to verse number five, like the lost, do you mind the things of the flesh or do you mind the things of the spirit? In other words, in what direction is your mind headed in? You know why your answer here is so important? Because it's also going to tell you in what direction your life is headed in. And maybe even your eventual outcome in eternity. So where our thoughts are is generally where our life is. And the only way we can change the thoughts and get into this walking in the Spirit that is a discipline. It doesn't come because we decide to, it becomes because we practice it. What is it that we have to do then to keep our thoughts on Jesus? We do have to study the Bible. We do have to pray. We do have to meditate on God. We do have to stay conscious of Him continually. It should be our busiest occupation and really take up the biggest part of our life, walking in the Spirit. And that's what it's going to take to make it right. That's what we have to do. Read our Bibles more than what we do. Pray more than what we do. Constantly praise God. Let me share a little something I just shared with my wife the other day. And I don't want to just boast in her, but I've never seen a Christian like her. I never did. And I live with her, okay? I, I live with her. I don't see any flaws in her. I, I don't know what it is. But, but you know what she used to do? Listen to this. When, when we were in the house and she'd be washing dishes, I was fascinated by this. We were just saved. She was constantly praising God, never stopped. We'd go to bed, she was praising God. She'd get up in the morning, she was praising God. It was constant, never stopped. And I began to realize that's what gives her that communion with God. And that's why he is so, so apparent in her life. And, and you'll discover this, brethren. The more you, just that simple thing, praise God continually. Don't stop. Just constantly praise Him every time you think about Him. And yet practicing it so you think of Him more and praise Him more. You're going to see victory following. You're going to see a victory come. Staying God conscious. And that is doing what? It's walking in the Spirit. To walk is to put one step out in front of the other. It's a continual occupation. When you walk in the Spirit, it's a continual occupation. You're moving with Him. You're flowing with Him. You're, company. You're in company with Him continually. Continually. Brethren, this is a must. This is the only way you can overcome. It's not by be be resolving to change or by determining to change or by beating yourself with a whip. Martin Luther tried that stuff. It never worked. The just shall live by faith, the Bible says. By faith. Faith in who? Faith in Christ and walking in His Spirit. Brethren, it does work. And, and I'm going to share this with you too, and I know I've said it so many times, but please, I've got to say it again. Don't quit. You might have been praying for years about a deliverance and you haven't been delivered yet. Don't stop trusting Jesus. Don't stop praying. I guarantee you, your deliverance will come. I promise you, before God, your deliverance will come. Because God wants you to overcome more than you want to overcome. So don't quit. Keep praying. Keep walking in God's Spirit. And brethren, really, get into God's Spirit. And do what we're told to do. Live in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and be constantly conscious of Jesus. That's what brings the victory. Himself. He comes into the life that is aware of Him and operates there victoriously. When you're anxious like that and you are frustrated and it becomes a battle, then it isn't really Christianity. 
Christianity is a very smooth operation of religion in your life, where God not only tells you what to do, he's giving you the will to do it, the power to do it, the joy in doing it. It's coming natural to you because he is in your life performing this, this wonderful act. And that's why he says, and think of the verse and the promise, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's a promise, right from God, right from the throne. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So how much more simple can they get? You, you know, these are pretty fanatical times and it's gonna take fanatics to make it through and be successful. And I mean, you know, and, and some of this does seem fanatical, but people are going to be fanatics for something in life. Why not for Jesus? Why not give it all to him? And, you know, they say, well, maybe that's going a little too far. But when you finally get to heaven, having passed all of the obstructions in this life to try to get, prevent you from getting there, whatever it took to get you there won't have been going too far. Believe me, we've got to make it to eternity. When we did evangelistic work, Maureen and I, we met so many pastors, so many pastors and got very close to them. But there was one pastor that more than all of them, all of the others stood out to me. I admired this man. He probably lived the purest life. There was just something so admirable about him. And you know what? He never, ever stopped praising God. In fact, at one time I asked his wife, does he always, is he always like this? She says, always. Never stops praising God. Never stops. He's constantly praising God. Constantly. There has to be a connection between his life and that praising. Between my wife's life and her praising. Because you're always in connection with God. He's able to keep them in perfect peace whose minds are stayed on him. He inhabits the praises of Israel and his people. He inhabits those praises. So constantly praise God. Get into that habit. Get used to it. And again, you, you can't change things on your own. I know I've given the illustration before, but it's worth repeating. The Bible tells us, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Which means the heart determines the habits. But don't stop there. The habits determine the lifestyle. It doesn't stop there. The lifestyle determines the eternity. Now, what happens when a guy gets in trouble in the world? They stick him in prison, some rehabilitation center, and they trace it backwards to the habit level. That's as far as they can go. Try to change his habits. And in prison or in a rehabilitation center, they change a little. But when he comes out, he goes back to doing what's natural. Can't change the heart. But what does Jesus do? He doesn't deal with the habit, he deals with the heart, the source of it all. Once he cleanses the heart and changes it, the habits change. Once the habits change, the lifestyle changes. When the lifestyle changes, he's no longer going to hell. He's a kingdom man. Because it all began in the heart and can only be solved in the heart. Jesus has got to get in there. And he's got to get in there to the full, especially in times like these. We have to walk in God's spirit. Brother, we have to learn how to do this. And practice it, practice it, practice it till we do. And you're never going to get so good you can stop at that level. You've got to do it more and more and more. There's no limits to Jesus. There's no limits to what he has for us. Brethren, we can even today be overcomers. Yeah. Remember to where sin abounds, God's grace does much more abound. Much more abound. God will always see to it, no matter how bad the day, that he gives us the strength we need to be overcomers. We don't have to pray, we don't have to come to the altar, but let's determine when we leave this building today, we're gonna to do more about our walk in the Spirit. More about our walk in the Spirit. Getting into the Bible, into prayer, into praise, into Jesus. And let it happen because it will and it does. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for your wonderful word and your, the encouragements, God, that we find in it. And God, we know that, Father, you are so anxious to see us in this world as overcomers. God, you have so much prepared for the overcomer. Your Bible tells us the overcomer will inherit all things, all things. And God, I pray that each one of us, God, will be overcomers in every sense of that precious, beautiful word. God, through Jesus, let us overcome, not through ourselves. God, let it not be a self-work that comes undone, but a spiritual work through your spirit, through your spirit, God. Help us, God, to get into the Bible more, into prayer more, into praising more, into meditation more, into being thankful more, into repentance more, whatever it takes, God, to get us close to Jesus, let us be there doing that every day of every year of our life. God, help us, one and all, to be everything we can be in Jesus. Make us, God, victorious. And God, no matter how long we've prayed, let us continue to pray. No, longer, no matter how long we've trusted, let us continue to trust you, God, for 
our deliverance. You alone, because only then, God, will, de will deliverance be indeed deliverance. God just blesses richly in Jesus, we pray, make us good witnesses, both God by our word and by our lives, by our example. In the name of Jesus, we praise you, God, and we thank you. Amen, 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 amen. Amen, amen. God bless you, folks. God bless you.